from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division, we welcome you to this book talk featuring Alonza Tehuti Evans, who will discuss the social impact of Prince Hall Freemasonry in the District of Columbia, 1823 to 1900, based on the book that he co-authored with Alton G. Roundtree entitled, The History of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia, 1822 to 2016. We thank you for joining us. I'm James Sweeney, Assistant Chief of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division. I would like to take a moment and express appreciation to all who made possible this event today, uh, to Sybil Moses, the reference specialist for African American history and culture who organized this event, the staff of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division, to Betty Culpepper, Leroy Bell, Darren Jones, and to Nichelle Wingfield of the Office of Special Events and Public Programs. We are especially appreciative of Mr. Evans for coming to the library to discuss his book with us. The Humanities and Social Sciences Division provides reference ser services and collection development for subjects that encompass information in all formats for the arts, humanities, uh, social sciences, local history, genealogy in the main reading room in the library's Thomas Jefferson Building. We now ask if you would please check your phones and other devices to assure that they do not interrupt today's program. This event will be filmed and for future uh, webcast. Note that the staff of the Retail Marketing Office uh, is selling copies of Mr. Evans' book uh, in the lobby outside of uh, this room. And now to introduce Mr. Evans, Dr. Sybil Moses of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division. Thank you, Jay. All right, good afternoon. Okay. We are extremely grateful for your presence, and your presence is an indication of a strong interest in research on Prince Hall Freemasonry. Today's presentation is important because Prince Hall Freemasonry is the oldest recognized and continuously active organization founded by African Americans with roots as early as 1775. In observance of this year's African American history theme, The Crisis in Black Education, we dedicate this presentation to three dynamic Prince Hall Masons, each a 33rd degree Mason and each involved in combating the crisis in black education. Charles Wesley, Amos T. Hall, and Thurgood Marshall. Charles Wesley served as president of Wilberforce University and Central State University, and he wrote the first scholarly biography of Prince Hall, as well as the history of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio, among other works. Amos T. Hall was the Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Oklahoma from 1941 until 18, 1971 and he served as president of the Conference of Grand Masters from 1950 until 1964, a period critical in the history of school desegregation. It was Amos T. Hall who encouraged Thurgood Marshall to join Prince Hall Freemasonry and later to appeal to the Masons for their financial report, support of the civil rights movement. Thurgood Marshall, General Counsel and Director of the NAACP's Legal Defense and Educational Fund, was also Director of the Prince Hall Masons Legal Research Department. This department funded the civil rights movement for a period of 10 years, formally, but had been funding the movement uh, before and then continues to do so. Later, Thurgood Marshall became Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Works by and about Charles Wesley, Amos T. Hall, and Thurgood Marshall are represented in the library's collections and on the bibliography that you have with you today. Our speaker 
Today, Mr. A. Tahuti Evans is the co-author with Alton Roundtree of the history of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia, 1822 to 2016. Mr. Evans and Mr. Roundtree are to be congratulated for their publication because the history of Prince Hall Freemasonry, as is the history of many African-American charitable, benevolent, and fraternal organizations, is one area in African-American history that is difficult to understand and explore. Published sources are largely inaccessible, and where they do exist, exist they are often scattered and incomplete. And Mr. Evans will tell you they traveled throughout the United States to pull together the research that was necessary to write that book. Too often, the personal papers of members and prominent leaders have not survived. One exception being Judge Robert Terrell's papers, who was Grand Master in the District of Columbia from 1899 to 1902. And his papers are held by the Library of Congress. Mr. Evans and Mr. Roundtree overcame all the obstacles, and today we have, I think, a, a really uh, definitive history of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. Mr. Evans is a prolific author and editor. He is a decorated Vietnam veteran, and among other things, he has been and is known ex affectionately as a cultural soldier, a college professor, an entrepreneur and a social activist. At Howard University, he majored in engineering and later served as a military engineer in the United States Air Force. His awards are many, but the one that caught my attention was when the Washington Urban League awarded Mr. Evans the Man of the Year Award and promoted him to Director of Employment and Training. Although retired, Mr. Evans has held several positions in Prince Hall Freemasonry in the District of Columbia. He served as the Grand Historian and Archivist of DC and also the editor of the Prince Hall Masonic uh, Digest. And as a side note, he is my go-to man whenever I have a question about Prince Hall Freemasonry that comes to the Library of Congress and I can't answer it, I'll call Mr. Tahuti. So please join me in welcoming A. Tahuti Evans. Oh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I would like to uh, take this opportunity first to thank Dr. Uh, Sybil Moses, uh, Mr. Sweeney, uh, and the whole staff of the Humanities and Social Science Division of the Library of Con Congress for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, but first, it is my uh, privilege to introduce uh, the Honorable Philip David, Grand Master of Prince Hall Masons in the District of Columbia. All right. Accompanying my Grand Master is uh, his wife, Mrs. Rosalie David, all right? And the Deputy Grand Master of Prince Hall Masonry of the District of Columbia, uh, and my lodge mate, uh, Brother Quincy Gant. Okay. Mm -hmm. As Sybil pointed out, um, the, uh, the book we produce, the History of the Most Virtual Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia, 1822 to 2016, uh, was a six-year work of research and writing. Um, but rather than talk about the details of the book, I'm going to talk about it in a way in terms of the social impact. <laughs> okay. Uh, today, I will, uh, the topics of discussion, uh, the early history of Prince Hall Masonry here in the District of Columbia, 1822 to 1849. I'm going to talk about the antebellum uh, period in the district, 1850 through 1862 specifically. The uh, Civil War to Reconstruction, 1863 to 1880. And finally, the post-reconstruction to the turn of the century, 1880 to 1900. Uh, the, early, in the early history of Prince Hall Masonry uh, well, Prince Hall Masonry starts in Washington, D.C. officially in 1825. But before 1825, there were some things that occurred which caused the um, uh, brothers to turn to Masonry as a way to solve their problems. 
when the uh, federal government, when the Constitution was written, it provided for the creation of the District of Columbia for the federal capital. After uh, the 10-mile the square was laid out and the uh, government moved from Philadelphia to Washington in 1800, uh, what, we've, what they found were there were some free African Americans living within the borders of the district, but there were no rules or laws which applied to them. There were only rules or laws that applied to those still in captivity in the institution of slavery. But in 1816, a unique set of experiences started to occur. The founding of the American Colonization Society. Now this was done because the, uh, the plantation owners, the slave owners, um, had a problem with the growing number of free Africans that were beginning to uh, live in the country, but there were no real provisions for them. The same was true here in the District of Columbia. So in 1816, they came up with a plan, of course, of shipping all free blacks out of America. Uh, they, they got funding and formed uh, what we know as the colony of Liberia on the west coast of Africa and set about trying to ship all free blacks to Liberia. Uh, in the district in 1821, following the um, lead of the American Colonization Society, the District Board of Aldermen uh, passed what we call the harshest set of black codes, which limited, limited it, the ability of free blacks to move about in the District of Columbia, and that caused quite a concern to many free blacks. So in 1822, a man, John W. Prout, a brother from Philadelphia, called a meeting in his house in Georgetown, and he had about 20 brothers who came to the meeting, and he made a plea to them that they should form a Masonic Lodge. And he used the example of what the brothers had done in Boston, Massachusetts as the reason why they needed to form a Masonic Lodge. Uh, what he talked about was one, the, the men who formed the who led the revolution and who were leading the government were mostly Freemasons. Uh, Prince Hall, the founder of the order, had found that uh, he was able to get citizenship status for free blacks in Boston by writing to the city council, having uh, white Freemasons on that council, and he found a listening ear. Uh, his first letter, in the, uh, you can find it in the, a book entitled The Letters of Prince Hall, uh, to this council was to get permission to build a school for the uh, free uh, black children of Boston, and that was granted. Uh, later on, he wrote and asked for permission to build a church. And later on, this lodge uh, wrote and asked for permission to build what we now know today is the historic African meeting house. So steps to citizenship were achieved in Boston, which had not been achieved anywhere else. In, 18, in 1797, however, uh, the same uh, plan was sh shipped to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania where Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, who had founded the um, uh, first black church in Philadelphia, um, came to Boston because they were, again, suffering from some of the same indignities because they were not included in the legislation as citizens of Philadelphia. So they wanted to reproduce the uh, what, what I call the Prince Hall template to assert their rights in Philadelphia. At that time, the government itself uh, was housed in Philadelphia. They didn't move to Washington until 1800. So while, in, while there, uh, a lot of the brothers who, had, who became Mace, Prince Hall Masons started to interact with those Masons in the federal government who helped them interact with the members of the Philadelphia legislature and the Philadelphia City Council, the Pennsylvania legislature and the Philadelphia City Council to get some rights for free blacks in Philadelphia. John Prout, being from Philadelphia, knew what had happened. Therefore, he called for the brothers meeting in his house in Georgetown in 1822 to try to replicate the Prince Hall plan here in the District of Columbia. Uh, they wrote uh, and asked for a permit to start a lodge. They got permission to do so, and on June of 1825, Social Lodge, what we call Social Lodge Number One, was established here in the District of Columbia. 
Upon establishing the lodge in the district, brothers began to take their case to court for citizenship. The first of those actually took place before the lodge was formed, and that's the case of uh, William Billy Coston. Uh, Billy Coston became the first secretary of Social Lodge Number no. 1, but he himself had a very interesting history. The Black Codes, which limited his ability to move about the city, which prevented him from being on the streets after 10 o'clock at night, which prevented him from assembling with more than two other black men on the streets, he felt were an injustice to him. So he took his case to court, and a Judge William Cranch heard the case. And he ruled that uh, Billy Coston uh, was grandfathered into conditions prior to the black codes being written. And all other free blacks who lived in, dis in the District of Columbia were not subject to the black codes since they were here before the codes were written. Another one of the members of Social Lodge, in fact, the worshipful master, John Prout himself, was later accused of um, helping slaves to escape on the Underground Railroad through the District of Columbia. Uh, he was a school teacher. He could read and write, and he was accused of forging passes for free blacks passing through the district to go north. Uh, from my reading of the record, uh, he was guilty. Uh, that was uh, part of what he did. In fact, Social Lodge Number 1 was one of the stations of the Underground Railroad through the District of Columbia. However, the men who wanted to bring in a handwriting specialist to look at this document he had produced to prove that he had written the document, the judge didn't allow it, ended up fining Brother Prout $50 and let him go. Same judge, William Krantz. <laughs> All right? A uh, third, a third uh, brother in the same lodge um, was Brother Clement Beckett. Now, Brother Beckett, had purchased some property in the District of Columbia while he was still, quote unquote, a slave. Uh, on this property, he built up two hot rooming houses, renting rooms to three blacks running through the district. Well, uh, two white gentlemen decided to try to take this property, stating that a slave couldn't own property. And since this property was a, a money-making uh, piece of real estate, they wanted to take control of it. But the, but the case, uh, again, heard before Judge William Krantz, uh, Judge Krantz ruled that Brother Clement Beckett uh, lawfully owned his property, and therefore uh, a, a precedent was established that free blacks could own property in the District of Columbia. So it seems that John Prout's um, original Discussion with the brothers was true. Becoming Masons, interacting with Masons in the district. By the way, the federal government, of course, moved here in 1800, and there were many Masons on Capitol Hill. There were many Masons who came to Washington to interact uh, with the government. And even the crisis of 1825, known as the uh, Captain William Morgan affair, didn't neg negatively impact the progress that the uh, brothers were making uh, as Masons in the District of Columbia. Let me, you know, before going to the, uh, the next step. So between 1825 and 1845, while uh, white Freemasonry was under attack from the anti-Masonic party and other individuals who were uh, disgusted with the rumors of the uh, murder of William Morgan, uh, he did disappear. Um, white Freemasonry kind of had their head underground, but black Freemasonry was growing. In 1845, uh, we created our second lodge in the District of Columbia, Universal Lodge. At that time, uh, Universal Lodge was uh, created in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, Alexandria was still part of the 10-mile square of the district at that time. So it was Alexandria, the District of Columbia, where this, the Lodge Brothers were uh, erected. The reason they were erected there, Alexandria being a port city, uh, several brothers had been made masons overseas in England, and uh, they resided in Alexandria and decided that it, the trip from Alexandria into Georgetown to meet with the brothers in Washington was getting uh, more difficult, so they wanted a lodge in Alexandria itself, so that was created. 
a year later, our third lodge, Felix Lodge, uh, was created in Washington, D.C., and what we, what the, what's called Western Washington. Uh, so by 1846, we had three lodges. Uh, two years later, in eight, March of 1848, these three lodges met in convention and formed the Grand Lodge. So as of 1848, we had the Union Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. Uh, in terms of the expansion of uh, masonry here in the District of Columbia. So by the time we reached the Grand Lodge status, we were here to stay. We weren't going anywhere. Uh, Union Grand Lodge created um, several ci civic organizations as a strategy to fight civil battles. What I mean is this. Instead of going into courts or interacting with the people in, in the city as a Masonic organization, the brothers decided to create what's called the Social Civil and Statistical Association, the Bethel Literary Association, and the Young Men's Literary Association. So as they met, they met under one of those three titles with other people in the public, sort of as a cover for what they were doing, uh, advocating again for rights for free blacks in the District of Columbia. But by 1862, uh, Abraham Lincoln had been elected president, and there was rumors afoot that he wanted to send all the black folks out of the United States of America. So Abraham Lincoln, uh, through one of his uh, men, requested a meeting of uh, a delegation of free blacks from the District of Columbia to discuss the plan, the plan he called the Panama Plan. In, this, in that meeting, John T. Coston, was a former Grand Master. In fact, he was the second Grand Master of Prince Hall Masons in the district. Ed, Edward W. Thomas had been Grand Master in 1861. And then there was this young up and comer, real um, energetic young man named John F. Cook Jr. His father um, founded the, uh, the second school for free black folks in the city. Uh, he himself had been run out of the city. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, his father had been run out of the city in 1835 during what was known as the Snow Riot. But, uh, and he would become, and he would be a future Grand Master for 1865 to 1873. Uh, and of this five man delegation, two other men, Cornelius Clark, was in the Social, Civil, and Statistical Association, but he wasn't a Mason. And Benjamin, Co Benjamin McCoy, a minister and teacher. In fact, he was the uh, founding minister of the Ashbury Church. Well, Abraham Lincoln made a long, a long plea to these men explaining why that after slavery he saw no way that uh, free blacks would want to live in a country with people who had enslaved them. He thought because of the deaths during the Civil War that uh, the former Confederates would never forgive blacks. They would, call, would charge them with being the reason that they lost relatives. So he had gotten $600,000 allocated from the United States Congress to ship all f blacks out of the United States to an area of Panama, to, well, it, was not, it was, wasn't called Panama at that time, but to Panama to become a, create a country of their own. Uh, he thought both free blacks and former slaves uh, shouldn't live in the country. And he needed this five man's delegation blessing to go about to the other free black communities and convince them to buy into his plan. This was August 14th, 1862. The five man delegation um, heard the president's call, uh, was polite, but and only one of the five thought about perhaps supporting the president's plan. But since he didn't get the support of the full five man delegation, Lincoln never brought the plan up again. So again, part of the impact of these men, especially those grand masters of Prince Hall Masons, the, with them saying no to the president, they wouldn't support the plan, I assert is one of the reasons there is a black Washington, D.C. community today. Because if Lincoln had gotten this way, there would be no African Americans in the country. They all would have been shipped out. Uh, a lot of people have, in a lot of historical settings, as our history is told, especially during this period, this Panama plan is never brought up. The discussion that took place with the president is never brought up. And as far as I know, no one else has made an assertion 
about the impact of them not accepting the president's recommendation. Okay. <laughs> See, new information. Again, <laughs> again in the uh, in the book, uh, we 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 cover the meeting, and in fact, we thought it was of such importance that we have the entirety of the president's address to the five-man delegation in the book. Okay. 1863 to 1880, talk a little bit about that time. Following the Civil War, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, was kind of unique because all of a sudden blacks began to move into uh, very important positions like in other, the Reconstruction governments across the South. John F. Cook, Jr., who I already mentioned, was appointed the, collect the collective taxes for the District of Columbia. William A. Telefaro uh, was elected to the Common Council in 1868. Carter A. Stewart was elected to the Common Council in 1868 and the Board of Aldermen in 1869. So for a time period, part of the legislative leaders of the District of Columbia were all Prince Hall Masons. And even though in the history of the District of Columbia you might see their names mentioned, no mention is made of the fact that they were Masons. Okay, again, uh, John F. Cook. John F. Cook Jr., as I said, was Grand Master of the District of, of, of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge. He served two terms. His first one was 1866 to 1873, and he came back in the chair in the East from 18, 1876 to 1877. He was appointed by Ulysses S. Grant, uh, D.C. Chief Tax Collector, serving a 10-year term from 1874 to 1884. Cook served as a district delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1872 and 1880, and he was also appointed to be D.C.'s jury commissioner in 1889. By the way, his wife was also an activist. Uh, Helen Apo helped found the National Colored Women's League. Another one of our brothers was James Wormley. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but um, James Wormley uh, built and owned the, uh, one of the most prosperous hotels in Washington, D.C. in the 1870s. His hotel was at 15th and 8th Street Northwest. In fact, it became a favorite for Washington's rich and famous, attracted by well-managed rooms, renowned cuisine. And in fact, his turtle soup and seafood uh, uh, were considered to be uh, excellent dishes. And amenities such as the first hotel elevator and the uh, the first telephone in the hotel was uh, in, in the Wormley Hotel at 15th and 8th Street. Uh, by the way, there's a school, the Wormley School in Georgetown, 3331 Prospect Street, which is there today, was uh, built and named in his honor. 1880 to 1900. Uh, because of Howard University, um, a lot of elite blacks were attracted to the District of Columbia, men such as Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, Dr. William A. Warfield. In 1886, uh, the Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia hosted the first ever uh, black industrial ex exposition. Um, that is, it was a black expo, 1886, right here in Washington, D.C., the only one held in the country during that time. But again, the brothers of the Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia are the ones who sponsored it. It was held at the Shiloh Baptist Church. Also during this time period, there are a lot of writers. By the way, this is a uh, catalog from that, um, from that expo. It basically read the catalog, first industrial exposition, the colored citizens of the District of Columbia, Masonic fraternity at Union Bethel Church, Annex, September 1886. Uh, we're still trying to, uh, I can't find an original copy of the document, but I, I have this uh, facsimile of it. Uh, some prominent uh, Freemasons in D.C. during this time period. Uh, Dr. Samuel R. Watts, in fact, he was um, in Lodge number 25. Uh, no, let me back up. Dr. Samuel Watts was the 29th, the 25th Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. He was an internationally known doctor and uh, was very prominent, uh, prominently uh, featured in uh, his visits to uh, several countries in Europe. Um, Solomon G. Brown, um, once described as probably the best employee of the Smithsonian Institution. 
In fact, the original director of the Smithsonian Institution wanted to appoint him as his successor and stated that he couldn't do it because him being black, he knew that the uh, white power structure of the government wouldn't allow it. But in, in most instances where he's talked about, he was the most knowledge, knowledgeable person about the holdings of the Smithsonian Institution than any other employee of that institution. Uh, the next slide is Hamilton S. Smith. He was the 29th Grand Master of Masons here. Uh, Hamilton S. Smith was also the son of the last living uh, master of African Lodge 459 of Boston. Uh, he was both a dentist and photographer. In fact, uh, one of his pictures is uh, graces the cover of a recently published book from Massachusetts about the Grand Lodge, the African, the Miss the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, with the uh, authors just uh, using the picture on the book and not knowing who took the picture or anything about it. The, the irony about the picture, uh, doing my research, in fact, I have the sister picture to the one that's on the cover of the book. The picture is of the most versatile Prince Hall Grand Lodge visit to Prince Hall Grave. And prominently in that picture, are a couple of past Grand Masters and some very important people that are not named on the cover of the book. Uh, the picture on the book contains is a picture of the men and women, the husband and wives who went to the uh, on that visit. The sister picture is just a picture of the men, the Masons who were on that trip. And again, that's part of our files. Uh, the other gentleman at the bottom, uh, Senator Blanche K. Bruce. Uh, was Prince Hall Mason. After, after serving his term in the, uh, uh, in the government, uh, rather than go back to Mississippi, he settled down and became a leading socialite uh, here in the District of Columbia. Uh, next to him is uh, the 23rd Grand Master of Masons here. This is Leonard C. Bailey. Leonard Bailey was the first uh, black millionaire of the District of Columbia. He made his money as he designed a uh, trestle of holding in uh, for, for, for body wounds, he invented the trestle to hold the body parts in for the wounded men. He also invented the uh, folding army cot. That, you know, in fact, that folding army cot, I slept on one when I was in the military uh, myself, so it's still in use. And he made millions, and the millions that he made made him the founder of one of the first, the first black bank in the District of Columbia, Capital Savings Bank, which was down on F Street Northwest, which is pictured beside it. Um, and as um, Dr. Moses pointed out, uh, two other people I like to talk about in uh, during the course of uh, writing uh, an article for the Masonic Digest, I wrote one about Washington, D.C.'s second most famous black power couple. And that is, uh, at that time, President Barack and Michelle Obama. But the first Washington, D.C., real black power couple was uh, Judge Robert Herberton Terrell and Mary Church Terrell. Now, uh, uh, Robert Terrell, again, was one of our grand masters at the turn of the century from 1899 to 1902. Uh, he was the first black appointed judge here in the city and um, was very, very significant in helping to found Sigma Pi Phi here in the District of Columbia. But probably more famously known was his wife, Mary Church Terrell. Mary Church Terrell lived until 1954. Uh, her husband passed away in 1925. She continued to be a leading social activist uh, fighting against segregation in the city. She was also a leading woman's suffragette. Um, in fact, uh, on the side, it, it's kind of a, a, a statement she um, didn't want to become a uh, member of the Eastern Star, the female uh, affiliate of Prince Hall Masons. Uh, she told she was just too um, forward thinking, she said, she, as an independent. She was fighting for women's rights, and uh, she wanted to be a leader in that, and she didn't want to be in the organization. But uh, she was a leading proponent, and right up and just before her death, uh, she led marches here in D.C. I personally remember, remember her from the uh, early protest at Glen Echo Park. If any of you are older Washingtonians and know right outside of the district, Glen Echo Park was an amusement park 
that again desegregated uh, wouldn't allow uh, uh, African Americans to attend, and she uh, marched against that establishment. So during the course of the 18th century, I'm sorry, the 19th century, uh, there are many books that's been written, literature written about blacks in D.C. during that period. Among those, Secret City, the History of Race Relations in the Nation's Capital by Constance Green, an excellent book I suggest uh, everyone would enjoy reading it. Another one, Aristocrats of Color, The Black Elite, 1880 to 1920. Though Willard Gatewood's book wasn't talking just about D.C., the largest percentage of the quote-unquote aristocrats of color were residents here in the city. Another book that talks a lot about the uh, uh, blacks in Washington, D.C., especially in the uh, latter part of the 19th century, is Leading the Race by Jacqueline and Moore. By the way, all of these books are here in the Library of Congress, and most of them can still be acquired through uh, some of the uh, book-selling outlets in the city. Uh, uh, the fourth book, The Black Anglo-Saxons by Nathan Hare, is another that talks about this unique black Washington, D.C. community. What was unique about it is that through all of the negative circumstances that people had faced, what gathered here in the District of Columbia, primarily due to the free, black Freemasons of the city, was the most sophisticated black middle class of any jurisdiction, any political jurisdiction in the nation. If you want to know where the quote unquote uppity blacks were, they were in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and I use that term affectionately, both said by members of the race and, and described by many newspaper uh, reporters as they reported on the behavior of these people. But the idea of being organized uh, fighting as an organized body for rights and establishing a, um, what, what I like to term a safe zone where black middle class people could freely express themselves, enjoy uh, citizenship without all of the um, pressures of black folks in, in, in other parts of the South. Remember, we're south of the Mason-Dixon line. There was nowhere else in the South where blacks had as much freedom and an expression of themselves or created as much wealth as what happened here in the District of Columbia. At the foundation of what made all of that possible were Prince Hall Freemasons. The fact that here in 18, 1822 was when the, when the uh, process began and the fact that they organized, fought for their rights, stuck together uh, is, is quite an achievement for that to have occurred in the South. In the North, they say that during, especially the antebellum days or during the 1800s, that uh, free blacks had more privileges. Uh, that might be true. But there was no city anywhere else in the nation where blacks had as much success during the uh, period of captivity uh, before the end of the Civil War. And immediately after the end of the Civil War, up to the turn of the century, the most successful uh, blacks in America as a group, as a class, uh, existed here in Washington, D.C. And this, their story is a result of the Prince Hall Freemasons of the city. Uh, we, we, we founded it. We are very proud of what we have done. And um, we, we only see uh, more success in the future. Uh, our next work will address our successes and impact during the 20th century. But uh, for this presentation, we limit it to the 19th century because at that time we think it reached kind of a peak of success that we like to talk about. Um, let me make sure. Okay, no, that was the last slide. But um, I hope that uh, this little short overview of the book, you know, has been informative. And before we go outside to uh, start signing autographs or selling the book, I would like to take this time to entertain questions from you about uh, 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 yes, sir. Was uh, Frederick Douglass involved in any way? Uh, Frederick Douglass did not become a Mason. In fact, um, I'll say Frederick Douglass got my personal opinion. Frederick Douglass thought that the s form of what we do in practicing Masonry, the substance of what Masonry is, 
was a waste of time. He thought that men should be spending more time outwardly working for the freeing of those in captivity. So, he, but his son was a Mason, but he didn't become. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Um, I'm also wondering, as a point of learning for myself, was everyone in the photograph black? Yes. <laughs> That's a, uh, yeah, well, yeah, okay, let me, let me answer this, let me answer the question this way. No, well, no, it's a, it's a very important question because oftentimes a lot of, a lot of African American historians shy away from this point. Um, the mixed race African Americans are 99.9% .9 a result of white plantation owners having sex with uh, captured women. Uh, today it would be called rape legally because you have power over somebody and you have sex with them that way. I mean they don't have the power to give consent since they are in captivity. So um, a lot of um, these plantation owners who had children with their uh, captive women uh, both respected and loved their children. And in many cases, they gave them a grub stake, as it were, and sent them up north to live as such, right? Um, Washington, D.C. became one of the primary landing places for a lot of mixed race people. Um, as an example, I'll talk about uh, Mary Church Terrell. Mary Church's grandfather was a white man that had a son with a black woman. He loved uh, his son, brought him up in his business, gave him money to he'd stay right there. I think it was uh, St. Louis or Kansas City, where his son even became very wealthy as such. And, uh, you know, and, their, and his daughter, Mary, Mary Church, uh, she was a feisty young woman. They sent her off to college. And her grandfather and father took her on a tour of Europe following her graduation from college as such. Uh, but a lot of people who looked at her, when they see her, they wonder what her ethnicity is. Um, in fact, uh, another one of the stories of our um, fraternity across the board is that um, in the early days, a lot of the leadership were mixed race brothers and sisters, were mixed race black men because of that one phenomenon. Not that they, they didn't escape and run north like a lot of blacks did, but a lot of them were actually given their freedom by their fathers and sent north or to other cities where they could live a decent life. And so I, I do understand uh, by looking at the pictures, you could think, wow, they all, they don't, they're not quote unquote dark black. <laughs> but because of the uh, one drop rule passed by the uh, government, you know, like the real status, if you had one drop of black blood, no matter what you look like, uh, you were considered black. And a lot of people, go, a lot of people uh, of mixed race, uh, of mix, a lot of mixed race people don't look black. In fact, one of the phenomena that occurred in this country, there's a term called passing. And a lot of black folks, a lot of people who by law would be considered black are passing for white because if you don't know their, they don't, you don't know their DNA or bloodline, you would never be able to tell that they had one drop of black blood. But that's a good question. Yes, sir. What's the relationship between the Costin family and uh, the power structure in Washington, D.C.? Oh, beautiful question. Well, William Costin was the grandson of Martha Custis Washington. Martha Custis' father uh, brought uh, him into the world, all right? So he, uh, Martha, uh, her father, Martha's father, all right, was his father also. Now, Martha had a mixed, uh, Martha's sister was a mixed race woman, uh, Native American and black. And um, when Martha got married, uh, her father gave her her stepsister, you know, as her captive. Uh, after Martha was married and had a child, her son, uh, when he got of age, he raped his aunt, not knowing it was his aunt. All right. 
And so her son had a child with her stepsister. So William Coston was both Martha's grandson and nephew as such. Now, he was such a uh, high-spirited and intelligent man that uh, when both George and Martha died, he left the plantation on, of his own free will and moved into the district. He became one of the most um, trusted men at the Bank of Washington. In fact, a lot of um, widowed women with monies would call on him to come to their homes to, or would send for him to come to their homes and get monies that he would go down and deposit in the Bank of Washington. By the way, the Bank of Washington is, today is in the exact spot where it was uh, during Billy's life. Uh, and he had the respect of a lot of whites of that time who knew what his um, parentage was. So they knew that he was a Custis Costa. And in fact, after Martha died, the Costin sisters, or the Custis sisters, had Billy do all of their banking and official work. They didn't trust their, they trusted him more than they trusted their own blood brother. So he had quite a status. In fact, when he died in 1842, he was the first African American to have, uh, to be eulogized on the floor of the House of Representatives. And the man who eulogized him was the former president and newly elected House of Representative um, John Quincy Adams. He eulogized him in 1842 on the House, on the floor of the House of Representatives. And in the newspapers of the day, it, you know, like his funeral procession was covered by all the local media in terms of the respect of the number of people who turned out to honor this man. Both black and white, he was one of the most honored men during his lifetime in the District of Columbia. Yes, sir. Uh, hard, yes, it was a six-year effort. Uh, a lot of the works are in the uh, Masonic Library in Iowa. Uh, thank God for the uh, Grand Master of uh, Masons of Iowa back in the late 1800s who had enough foresight to say that it was his intention to, f to create the best Masonic Library in America. And uh, he told his man, hey, hey, he, he didn't care about the rules. He wanted all of the proceedings of the black masons in the country as well as the white masons. So thanks to him, a lot of original records or copies of the original records are at the Iowa Masonic Library. Uh, th there's another process in masonry where um, the, um, we, we have a CCFC, a um, chairman, Chairman, chairman of the Committee on Foreign Correspondence, whose responsibility it is to communicate with other Grand Lodges. Uh, whenever a, when we printed our proceedings for what we did for the year, our chairman would send copies or at least write a summary of what we had accomplished for the year and send those summaries to other Grand Lodges. So we had to go out and uh, look in the records of other Grand Lodges for CCFC reports. And um, I guess the other thing, uh, my background in as a historian, <laughs> uh, I went back to school after engineering and got degrees in history and philosophy. But in studying African American history, uh, prior to becoming a Mason, a lot of these people, I knew their place in society and contributions they had made from my background as a historian. I didn't know they were Masons until six you know, within the last six years. By the way, um, um, I was asked, I volunteered to assist Brother Roundtree. In fact, I was asked to volunteer because of my background as a African-American historian. To, Brother Roundtree is a researcher and a writer, but wasn't necessary, what didn't at that time consider himself a historian. So we wanted to add this flavor to the works that would be produced. So I was quite surprised to find that a lot of the people who were already heroes of mine from black, black history were also Prince Hall Masons. And so it, you know, so it was kind of like a cross-fertilization. My background plus the Masonic records, my method of research uh, added to Brother Roundtree's method of research. Uh, it was definitely a work of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am.
the wealth though that was created in the district from the wealthy blacks, mm -hmm. how would you say that triggered or impacted other areas of the country? In other words, were because I'm from the South, mm -hmm. that's where my roots are, would you say that they had any impact on Southern? Oh yes. Um John T. Coston, um, as an example, uh, was personally responsible for uplifting uh, blacks in Georgia. He left D.C. and was called a quote-unquote carpetbagger. But after, after the war, he went to uh, Georgia, traveled all over the uh, state organizing black folks, uh, both for the purpose of uh, organizing them to vote, to get some empowerment in that way, and also in community meetings, uh, teaching them how to organize their resources for their own upliftment. Uh, another gentleman, um, Richard Howell Gleaves, uh, who was a past national uh, grandmaster and from uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, went to South Carolina. In fact, he was elected the um, Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina during the Reconstruction era. He was from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but then he came back and settled down, became a member of, of the uh, Al Body in Washington, D.C. But his personal wealth and knowledge uh, helped uplift the, um, that did again, uplift the uh, brothers in, in uh, South Carolina. So there was a way that uh, the people, our knowledge and organizing skills went south to organize in the south the newly freed Africans there, right, to help them get their act together. Another thing that people might not know, but both uh, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen of the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, were both grand masters of uh, masonry in the state of Pennsylvania, and uh, they sent uh, riding bishops into the south to organize churches the two elements of what makes a community were the organized men as masons and the church as the anchor for spiritual development as such, right? And again, those ideas flowing from Prince Hall Masonry went to settle and help create the successful uh, communities of blacks in the South following the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, well, um, because of uh, the Grand Lodge being here in 1867, I think, when uh, how it was formed, that the, um, the, the, those men who created the institution depended on a lot of the, the, the brothers in Prince Hall Masonry to help give them a way and get them set up. Uh, Dr. Uh, Warfield, who set up Howard University's uh, surgery department, was also one of our grand masters, grand master of masons, all right, here in the District of Columbia. Uh, I, I don't have a list of all the professors, but there was always a close relationship between our Grand Lodge and men at Howard. In fact, from 1865 until 1925, if you were an African-American man in America, the highest social status you could have was being a Mason, being a Prince Hall Mason. The reason I put that date in line in there is because 19, from 1904 through 1925 is the period of the creation of the uh, Greek fraternities on college campuses. And over time, even though each one of them used our procedures and our handbooks to create their organizations as such, right? Uh, as one became educated through time in the minds of some people, being a Greek in a Greek fraternity was a higher status than being a Mason. But about, I'll say from 1920 to 19, until 2016, or until today, one of the most reverent statements that you can make is that you're a double brother. 
Now, double brothers are Mason and a Omega, or Mason and a Alpha, or an Omega, a Mason and a Kappa, or what have you, but double brothers. So, <laughs> you know, like it's it's we created them. They they've come back and we've joined. So we both have the the fraternity, the, the college fraternal order, and Prince Hall Masonry all have the same goals for our communities. It's uplift and moving forward. Yes, that's the last. All right. Uh, Last question, yes, sir. I kind of know what you mentioned in terms of black masons and white masons. Who caused that rift that split off? Can you explain that a little bit? Okay, well, um, I'll put it this way: is the um, when, when the masons of of uh, the revolutionary period designed the uh, documents, uh, which are the foundation of this country. Um, in fact, 13 of the 39 men who created the Constitution were Masons. Uh, the first country in the world to have a Constitution is the United States. And the idea came from the fact that Masonry was run by Anderson's Constitution. And many of the elements in the U.S. Constitution duplicate what's in Anderson's Constitution. But the, um, what we call America's original sin, uh, not just slavery, but the discrimination that slavery caused. Uh, though our tenants say that uh, in the country that all men are created equal, the government didn't practice that. And though Freemasonry is, a, is an organization itself which states that all men are brothers, so we, don't, we only deal with each other based on what's in our hearts. In those days, Masonry didn't do that. So there was discrimination. There were whites who, wouldn't, who didn't allow their interaction. Uh, my co-author wrote a uh, piece several years ago called Two Faces, One Public and One Private, and which was, which, which, what was pointed out is that there have always been white Masons who work with and help black Masons move forward. But at the same time, there have always been white Masons who did everything they could to prevent us from moving anywhere and who denied our legitimacy as such, right? So that's internal politics. So in America, as opposed to anywhere else in the world, uh, what's called Prince Hall Freemasonry is uh, talked about as black Freemasonry or African American Freemasonry. But the truth of the matter is both groups practice the exact same thing. Both groups do. But again, the legacy of racism and discrimination uh, uh, has, is still with us. There are, of the 50 states in the country, there are eight Grand Lodge of white Masons, primarily in the South, who don't recognize black Freemasonry as a legitimate fraternal organization. Therefore, when we talk, we have to talk about white Masonry and black Masonry when we bring up those circumstances. Okay? Well, thank you very much. Okay. You know, I really would like to thank uh, Tahuti Evans for honoring our invitation because every time he speaks, he speaks as he has spoken today, okay? His mind is so fertile and it's such a wonderful experience. Every conversation you have with this man is so enlightening. And what he has done with Alton Roundtree is enable us now to tell the story of African Americans in the District of Columbia because now historians can now take their work and integrate it into future histories. And this is what is needed across the country. This is what is needed. We invite you to come back again. While you're here, please go down and register in room 140 to become a registered reader of the Library of Congress so that you can come back and use our collections. Please also use the bibliography that we have prepared to see what we actually have in, in our collections. It's, it's unbelievable when you look and dig what is here. Just the other day, I called to Hootie and I said, you know, I, I found a letter by John Cook. You know, is this our John Cook? And he said, yes. It was John Cook Sr. It's a letter, 1837, 1837. downstairs. And the uh, curators in the manuscript ha collection have pulled that document out along with some other documents so that we can go down and actually see them, all right? So what I have for you, Mr. Evans, and for you, Mr. David, is a copy of one of the, mm -hmm, 
a copy of one of the reports that Thurgood Marshall made to the uh, NAACP's Legal Defense Fund talking about the money, actually documenting. It was his report to the Conference of Grand Masters where he documents what the funds that the Prince Hall Masons gave to the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund actually achieved. Okay, and we know that there were over 400 school desegregation cases. So you have that, okay? And on a final note, my father was a double brother. He, he left Howard, he was drafted while he was a student at Howard University to go to Tuskegee Army Air Flying School as a Tuskegee Airman. And while he was in Tuskegee, Alabama, he became a Prince Hall Mason. He went through Lewis Adams Lodge. And for those of us who know, Lewis Adams was one of the founders of Tuskegee Institute along with Booker T. Washington. And so they named a lodge after him. And my father went through that lodge. And one of the things he has always told us is that to be a balanced black person, you have to belong to the craft and to a fraternity. That's what he would say. He said, because there you get the representation of all of us. And he said that Prince Hall Freemasonry was the gatekeeper of our culture. And you can hear from Tahuti's presentation today how it is. You cannot tell the story of African Americans in this country without telling the story of Prince Hall Freemasonry. So thank you again for coming. The book is available outside, and we hope you'll come back. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.